This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Hello and welcome to WLC Radio, where we bring you truths for these last days from Yar's Word. I'm your host, Miles Roby. And I'm Dave Wright. Thanks for tuning in. If this is your first time joining us, you'll hear us refer to the Father and the Son by names that may be a bit unfamiliar. On WLC Radio, we prefer to use their personal names rather than the titles of God or Lord. The Father's personal name is Yahuwah, or Yah. The name of the Son is Yahushua. El and Eloah are Hebrew titles, which mean Lord. Elohim is the plural of Eloah and refers to both the Father and the Son. So, with that said, I want to make sure we all know who we're talking about here. (laughs) I'm going to turn the time over to Dave, because he's got something that he's rather eager to discuss. Yeah, thanks for that, Miles. Well said. Um, I have indeed, yes. It's a beautiful, stirring topic. Now, I know it's inspired my wife and me, and I'm eager to share it with our listeners today. By way of introduction, let me ask you, Miles, mm-hmm. have you ever known someone who seemed to, how shall I put it, have it all together? Somebody you were almost jealous of for, for being so perfect? No, no, I'm not talking about some rock star from when you were a teen here. <laughs> no, you, you just take all, all the fun out of it, don't you? <laughs> um, I can't say I've really ever encountered anyone that was particularly perfect, but I've known some real great people, and uh, not anyone, though, I'd necessarily classify as inverted commas perfect but have you have you dave well yes actually i Ah. have when i was 16 there was this new kid that transferred to our school stephen was just about as perfect as a kid can be he came from a well-to-do home now he was smart now really smart polite to the teachers so they liked him good at sports so all the guys liked him Mm. handsome and courteous to the girls so they were all a twitter over him (laughs) he was just i don't know Just an all-round perfect chap. But it sounds almost too perfect, if you ask me. So, what what was it? Was it all a front? Did he uh, kick puppies and steal babies, lollipops behind everyone's backs, that kind of thing? (laughs) Well, that's just it. You'd think that he had some glaring flaw. Yeah. But the truth is, he was just a really great guy. I remember once, after school, and we were walking outside, and one of the younger kids saw him. Hi, Stephen! And he grinned back at the kid. Hey, how's it going? (laughs) I was curious how he knew the kid, and so I asked him, who was that? Mm -hmm. And he laughed, kind of sheepishly, looked behind him to make sure he couldn't be overheard, and admitted, I don't know. But all the little kids seem to like me. They always say hi anyway. What? (laughs) Well... I knew why the little kids liked him. He was nice to them. Mm. A lot of the older students would bully the younger kids. You know how it goes sometimes? Mm, They could get quite mean, but Steve never did that. He was just this really kind person and genuinely interested in the welfare of others. Mm. Sounds a great guy, really. Whatever happened to him? Well, I'm not really sure. He went into medicine, I know, but we went to different universities, so we lost touch after that. But if I had to put it into words, what set him apart as different, I would say that Stephen lived to bless others. Uh He was the embodiment of ministry. 
Mm, we need more people like that in the world, don't we? Yeah, we do. And, and Scripture talks about it too. You've got the ministry of the sons of Eli and you've got the ministry of the sons of Zadok. Now, Eli, as you recall, was high priest in the early days of Israel. Mm-hmm. He may very well have been born during the wilderness wanderings. His son, Phineas, was named after a grandson of high priest Aaron, whom Yahweh himself praised for being zealous for Yah's sake. Such zealous devotion had been diluted in Eli, though, and was totally lost in his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. These men served as priests, but they were very wicked. They really were. First Samuel chapter 2 says, quote, The sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not Yahweh. Unquote. They stole from the offerings of the people who came to sacrifice to Yah, taking the best part for themselves. Yeah, it was terrible. They desecrated mm. the name of Yah by their offences. Here, read these verses from First Samuel chapter 2. It's quite appalling, actually. Okay, um... Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before Yahweh, for men abhorred the offering of Yahweh. Now Eli was very old, and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle at the congregation. That is absolutely terrible. It's horrible. Mm. Well, I read somewhere that men quit taking their wives and daughters to the tabernacle for the feasts just Mm. to try and protect them from Hophni and Phinehas. Now, I will say that Eli tried to remonstrate with them. He told them, quote, It is no good report that I hear. Ye make Yahweh's people to transgress, unquote. Mm. But the thing is, he was a very indulgent father, and they knew it. They Mm. continued doing what they wanted to do, and he did nothing about it. Well, what could he do? Well, as high priest, he could have revoked their priestly privileges and removed them from holy office, but he didn't. They were allowed to remain priests and their influence on the people dragged down the whole nation. You'll remember when the boy Samuel was 12, Yahuwah spoke to him and gave him a prophecy about the house of Eli. Yeah, I remember that. He was going to remove from Eli's line the office of the high priest, wasn't it? Yes. In fact, why don't you read it for us? It's very mm-hmm. clear. First sure. Samuel chapter 3, and it's verses 12 to 14, please, Mars. Okay. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. The prophet Ezekiel was given a vision that drew a sharp distinction between the two different types of ministries, what we're calling the sons of Eli versus the sons of Zadok. Ezekiel was shown in vision how the priests, the spiritual leaders of the people, desecrated the sanctuary and committed all different kinds of abominations. Ezekiel was a contemporary of Daniel during the time of the exile into Babylon, right? Yeah. How could the people still be in Jerusalem desecrating the temple? Well, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came against Jerusalem three times. Daniel and his three friends were taken to Babylon the first time. Solomon's temple wasn't totally destroyed until the third time Babylon attacked Jerusalem. Ah, uh, right, OK, yeah, I get it. So, get it. Yah shows Ezekiel what's going on by the spiritual leaders of the people, and Ezekiel is utterly shocked. He's mm. just appalled. How could this be allowed to continue? Now, read what Yah tells Ezekiel about the fallen ministry, the sons of Eli. It's found in Ezekiel 44, and it begins with verse 10. Yeah. Okay, I've got it. It says, And the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, as gatekeepers of the house and ministers of the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister to them. And... That's intriguing, actually, because uh, Yah's not removing them from office. No, the sons of Eli are left in office, but it comes at a price. So just keep reading. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. Because they ministered to them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity, therefore I have lifted my hand in an oath against them that they shall bear their iniquity. 
And they shall not come near me to minister to me as priest, nor come near any of my holy things, nor into the most holy place. Nevertheless, I will make them keep charge of the temple for all its work and for all that has to be done in it. The sons of Eli are not kicked out of office. Mm. The sons of Eli represent a flesh religion that is far apart from the purity of Yahuwah. They are the tele-evangelists who live in multi-million dollar homes while telling Mm. their impoverished parishioners to give more and more and more if they want to receive Yah's blessing. They are the visible leaders, the ministers with degrees after their name. They write books and papers that influence the spirituality of the people. They are the people who head up the planning committees and building committees and whose names are used to bring support for various projects. These are the people that are religious for what it can get them, money, power and influence. You see, I have to say, I've known people like this. When I was a kid, we had a really devout pastoral couple. They were absolutely lovely people, really humble, totally committed to Yah and doing his will. They revealed Yahushua in their lives like I've rarely seen it. And then when I was about was about 15, actually, mm. they were transferred to another church. And the new pastor and his wife were about as different from the first as you could get. Uh, the pastor's sermons, even to my 15-year-old ears, were nothing but... Um, Fluff, let's say. (laughs) They were charismatic, wordly, uh, shallow, complete night and day difference, if you know what I mean. Mm. And the important thing was the spiritual life of the church, it was affected. Where before it had been thriving spiritually, under the new pastor, it, it, it languished, I guess is the best word to use. Yeah. I believe that, actually. That's how it always is. As Mm. with the leaders, so with the people. Yeah. Well, so the sons of Eli continue to hold their positions, but, and here's the crucially important point, Mm -hmm. but they minister unto the people only. Not only are their corrupt hearts perfectly attuned to a people of hardened hearts, but the people want to be ministered to by the worldly sons of Eli. Minister to, what do you mean? Well, Dr. C.R. Oliver, in his book, The Sons of Zadok, says it well. He writes, quote, Who is going to bury the dead, marry the young, dedicate babies, visit the sick, counsel the troubled, care for the homeless and sponsor church suppers? Who is going to preach on Sunday or Saturday or whatever day chosen as holy? Who is going to decide what buildings are to be built and programmes to be followed? Who is going to keep the church bulletin filled with information? Who will make the decision as to which off-staff minister will visit to offer the congregation a fresh face and some other new program? Who will be responsible for men's gatherings and fish dinners? Let the compromised sons of Eli handle these matters, unquote. People with stony hearts are ministered to by priests of stony hearts. Mm. Oh, I see, I'm, I'm still confused. See, I thought that's what ministers were supposed to do. But you're saying it's the corrupted sons of Eli that fill this role. Well, you flatter me. I'm not saying it. Yahweh is saying it. Remember what you read in Ezekiel 44. Just Mm. read it again, verses 13 and 14. Okay. They shall not come near unto me to do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place, but they shall bear their shame and their abominations, which they have committed. But I will make them keepers of the charge of the house, for all the service thereof, and for all that should be done therein. The sons of Eli and the sons of Zadok have two separate and distinct functions. The sons of Eli minister to the people, but the sons of Zadok minister unto Yah. Hmm. And that's that's a new thought. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, let's talk about the sons of Zadok and their ministry. We'll be right back. There's a popular teaching in Christianity that the divine law was nailed to the cross with Yahushua. This is interpreted to mean that the divine law no longer needs to be kept. And truthfully, something was nailed to the cross but it wasn't the Ten Commandments. WLC invites you to do a careful study of Colossians 2. 
learn the truth of what was nailed to the cross, what was not, and the significance for Christians today. Go to worldslastchance.com and read What Was Nailed to the Cross, an examination of Colossians 2. Again, that's What Was Nailed to the Cross on worldslastchance.com, because what you don't know can hurt you. You were just saying, Dave, that the sons of Eli minister to the people, but they don't minister unto Yah. So tell us more. What what do you mean by that? Well, Yahweh had shown Ezekiel the clergyman's hearts, and Ezekiel was appalled. He begged Yah to do something about it. But instead, Yah explained that the corrupt clergyman would be allowed to continue. If the people were satisfied with adulterous, worldly leadership... Yahuwah wouldn't intervene. The corrupt sons of Eli would continue to hold church office. However, such clergymen would not minister unto Yahuwah. Only those with pure hearts can minister to a pure Eloah, and the sons of Eli do not qualify. This high honour is reserved strictly for the sons of Zadok. So turn back over to Ezekiel 44, if you've still got it there, Miles, um, yeah. and just read verses 15 to 16. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith Yahweh. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. The sons of Zadok don't minister to the people. They minister to Yah. They stay faithful to him in the face of overwhelming apostasy. Mm. They are his. Now, read verses 23 and 24. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And in controversy they shall stand in judgment and they shall judge it according to my judgments. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all mine assemblies, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. The sons of Zadok are in a class by themselves. They don't need the outward trappings of religiosity. They don't hallow man-made traditions. They don't need to wear the clerical colour in order to gain people's respect. The sons of Zadok keep Yah's laws and statutes. They hallow his Sabbaths. They are teachers of the people speaking Yah's words to them. They are holy people doing a holy work, and the people around them can tell that Yah is with them and in them. Their lives are are different. They walk and talk and eat and entertain differently. Their lives reflect the holiness of Yah. They take seriously the injunction in 1 Peter chapter 1, Be ye holy as I am holy. It sounds like what you're saying, Dave, is that the main thrust of this Eli system is maintenance of the status quo. Yes, I suppose it is, perpetrating an existing system at all costs. Dr Oliver, from whose book The Sons of Zadok we quoted in our last segment, explains the differences between these two systems. Hmm. He writes, quote, The Eli system is a prop-up program. Right. It can only be maintained as long as there is someone willing to prop it up. Yahweh's message is that the sons of Zadok, under his authority, will be brought to the forefront and the prop will fall. Yahweh will generate events in the course of history that will demand their rise. The sons of Zadok will challenge every sorry detail of the Eli system, unquote. So the Eli system separates man from Yah, whilst Zadok system draws repentant souls into an intimate relationship with the Father. Yes, exactly. Total right. and complete surrender to the will of Yahweh yeah. brings yeah. with it unprecedented rewards. In Zechariah chapter 3, we've been presented with the vision of Joshua and the angel. Mm. You'll recall that Joshua, the high priest, was clothed in filthy garments, but he was repentant, wasn't he? 
Right, yeah. And Yar commanded that his filthy garments be removed and he be given a change of garments, signifying Yar's righteousness. Yeah, this is describing the process by which a person becomes a son or a daughter of Zadok, completely committed to Yar and his service. And the rewards are limitless. Mm. Zechariah 3 Verse 7, please. Yep, I've got it right here. Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. This is the reward given those who are willing to be completely emptied of self and totally filled with Yah. They are recreated in the divine image. They're now co-partners with Yahushua. They minister to Yahuwah. Now turn over to Ezekiel 36 and read for us verses 26 to 28, please, Miles. Ezekiel 36. Yep, I'm going to hear him. It says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Now, he is willing to do that for any of us. But only the sons and daughters of Zadok surrender their wills and allow that transformation to take place. You see, it's not something we achieve through rigorous self-denial. If you have a secret sin, and you just really crave committing that sin, but you exert all your willpower to not commit it, even though you still really want to, that sin still has sway in your life because you still want to do it. However, when you go to the Father and you say, please recreate me in your image, I'm willing to be made willing to give this up. He will so transform you that when you obey his will, you will be doing what you want to do in the first place. Mm, Total transformation of everything, including the hidden desires of the heart, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm. The sons and daughters of Zadok have a living connection with their creator. They thrive on constant contact with Yahweh. They reach the point where it is impossible to tell where he begins and they end. Yahweh and the sons and daughters of Zadok are one. They have free access to the divine presence. Their wills are hid with Yahushua in the Almighty. When doing his will, again, they are but carrying out the dictates of their own desires. They are, as Joshua was described in Zechariah 3, men to be wandered at. Their demeanour, the very expressions on their faces and the tone of their voices reveal what Yah would be like, how he would live and move and speak were he on earth. Like Moses, they have come from the very presence of the Most High and people take note of it, that they have been with Yah. Mm. So before we run out of time, let's get practical here. This is such an exciting possibility to me, you know, that, to be co-partners with the divine. But now, how? How do we leave the old system behind and embrace the destiny of being sons and daughters of Zadok, ministering to the Most High? Okay, well, as we've just said, Yahweh must write his law on our hearts. And it's a gift. You read in Ezekiel 36 where it said, quote, a new heart also... What does it say next? A new heart also must you generate on your own? No, no, no. It says, will I give you? A new heart also will I give you. So we go to him and we ask for it. But then what do we do next is important. Remember, Yah will never force the will. Mm. How we maintain the gift given is very important. Yeah, I can see that. We're not going to maintain that closeness to Yah as one of his ministers if we go back and sit at the feet of the sons of Eli, listen to them preach, and then allow their corrupted doctrines to influence our thinking. Yes, precisely. Now, this is why in Revelation 18, John hears a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Or, as we've discussed in previous programmes, the more accurate translation is Go out of her. Yeah, and I think that's a very, very important point right there. 
because I, I used to think that my denomination was exempt. So come out of her was an invitation to join my group. But you can't be a minister of Yah if all you do is migrate within the Eli system from one son of Eli to another. No, exactly, you can't. Now, if you want to minister to Yahweh, you first must be taught of Yahweh. And you're not going to find that in any of the system churches and religious organisations. Mm. Now, listen, you're not alone. Throughout time, Yah's people have always walked apart, learning directly from him. Mm, and that's true, isn't it? Because at 40, Moses thought he was ready to free Israel. But it took another 40 years learning in the desert where he could commune one-on-one -on -one with Yah before he was ready for his high calling. Elijah was another son of Zadok. He lived a very solitary life, preparing for his mission to Israel. Yah spoke to him in a still, small voice. Now, you're not going to be able to discern that still, small voice surrounded by the voices of others claiming to speak for Yah. Mm. It is only when we're one-on-one -on -one with our Creator that we can learn directly from Him. Yeah, and that's a very good point right there. John the Baptist was another one, wasn't he? In fact, he was even referred to as the man of the wilderness. Mm. Heaven is raising up an entire generation of priests, sons and daughters of Zadok, who will walk in righteousness before him. These people cherish him. They mm. long to know his will, and once they know it, they instantly obey. And I can see how the worldly system of Eli will hold no attraction for the sons and daughters of Zadok. So now the question comes to each one of us, which ministry do you choose? Do you want to be ministered unto by system sons of Eli? You can worship in a beautiful church, listen to thrilling music sung by good choirs, enjoy potluck dinners and fellowship suppers. You can minister to people and be ministered unto by other people, focusing on everyone's felt needs. You can receive the praise and appreciation of men, but you may not minister unto Yahweh. Or are you willing to be called out of Babylon? Are you willing to leave behind all human organizations, all human structures and support systems, and step out, independent and alone, and be a minister unto Yahweh. It won't be an easy road. Oh, no. no. You'll face opposition, maybe even persecution. You must be willing to sacrifice anything that comes between you and your maker. Ministering to Yahweh begins with clean hands and a pure heart, for only people in agreement with Yahweh can minister unto him. It's a completely different life path, isn't it, Dave? The rewards are very different. Instead of the approval and adoration of men, you will be beloved of heaven. You will have direct access at all times to the throne of omnipotence. Because your prayers will be in agreement with the divine will, they will receive answers. Angels will cooperate with you as you stand as a spokesperson for heaven. Peace that passeth understanding will fill your heart. You'll be surrounded with a heavenly atmosphere. Others coming into contact with you will breathe in this heavenly atmosphere. And despite opposition and persecution, you will be a blessing wherever you go. You will be Yahweh's voice, his hands, his heart, to reach others because there is no separation between your will and his. Which ministry will you choose to be a part of? What are you willing to sacrifice for Yahweh to be your inheritance? Choose ye this day. Will you be a minister to the people only? Or will you minister unto Yahweh? You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Hell. Aside from being an overused swear word, the concept of an ever-burning hell has troubled multitudes of Christians for nearly 2,000 years. Greek philosophy began merging with Christianity at the end of the second century, and with it came the concept of an eternally burning hell. And let's face it, Scripture does refer to hell. 
However, it's not what most people think it is. To find out what the Bible says about hell, go to our website at worldslastchance.com. Watch our video, Hell, You've Got It All Wrong, or look for it on YouTube. That's Hell, You've Got It All Wrong on worldslastchance.com. I have got a fantastic question from our Daily Mail about today. Oh, yes. <laughs> Go on then, what is it? <laughs> it's Henrik from Reykjavik, Iceland, and he says, Some friends and I have been watching your videos on prophecy. You have a lot of unique views. Could you please tell us how you can be certain of your prophecy interpretations? Thanks. Well, that is a great question. Mm. Prophecy is so important. And yet so many people hold so many different views and they're often contradictory. Yeah, yeah. And they can't all be true. Knowing how to determine whether an interpretation of prophecy is consistent with scripture is really important. Yeah, you're right, it is. Well, first of all, there are some ground rules the student of scripture needs to accept. The yeah. first is that every word must have its proper bearing on the subject being studied. You can't ignore or leave anything out. No, right. Now, all scripture is necessary, and what's more, all of it can be understood with diligent study. Mm. Next, understand that there is nothing revealed in scripture that can or will be hid from the humble learner who asks in faith. Yah wants us to understand. He's not playing with us. No, here. exactly. So with that understood, you're ready to begin studying whatever passage of Scripture you're wanting to understand. Now, the first rule WLC adheres to is one of the most important, and it mm. is this. To understand anything in Scripture, bring all the passages together on the subject you wish to know. Then let every word have its proper influence. If you can form your theory without a contradiction, you cannot be in error. Mm. Well, what if certain verses contradict other verses? We've had this before. For, for example, you get some Christians believing in an eternally burning hell. Yeah, mm. You get others who believe in soul sleep. And the thing is, they both can quote texts to prove their position. Yes, that's precisely why you need to look at every single verse, not just the ones that support your pet theory. Mm. You've got to look at everything. And, and as you do this, it will become clear which position is supported by the weight of evidence. Oh, I see. I mean, that's good. But what's next? Well, Scripture needs to be its own expositor. Let it interpret itself. All right. OK. Can you give us an example? Of course. Here we go. Take Daniel 7. The chapter begins with Daniel explaining what he saw. He says, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Mm. He describes what they look like and then goes on to talk about what they do. And Daniel's left going... What was that? <laughs> yeah, he kind of didn't understand what was going on, did he? <laughs> no, he didn't, exactly. Yeah. So he goes up to a heavenly being and asks, what is this? What does it mean? Now, why don't you read verses 16 and 17 for us? Yes, no problem. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So right there, you've got an interpretation. The beasts yeah. are kings. Later in the same chapter, they're referred to as kingdoms. And not just any kingdom. They are geopolitical powers mm. in terms of how far their influence reaches. So this is scripture explaining itself, defining its own symbols. So when you go over to Revelation and read where John says that he sees a beast rise up out of the sea and a little later another rise up out of the land, you can know that what he's describing is the rise of geopolitical powers. And that makes sense, total sense, but because you, you, you're staying consistent. But what's next? Well, symbols are used a lot in prophecy, and there have always been a symbolic meaning for things. Mountains are governments, uh, beasts are kingdoms, waters are people, lamps refer to Yah's word, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's important that we don't literalise what's symbolic or symbolise passages that are intended to be literal. Right. Parables are used to illustrate various subjects, and they must be explained in the same way as symbols. Right. Now, here's where it can get a bit tricky. Uh -huh. Sometimes a symbol or a figure can have two or three different meanings. 
Oh, uh, right. OK, like what? Well, uh, take the word day. In Ecclesiastes 7.14, the word day simply refers to an indefinite period of time. Right. However, in Ezekiel 4.6, you get the principle that is so important to so many prophecies, and that is a day equals a year. Mm. Finally, over in Second Peter 3, verse 8, you've got a day equaling a thousand years. And that's in addition to the literal meaning of a 24-hour, or in some cases, 12-hour time period. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. So, so what do you do? Well, look at it from every angle. If you put the right construction on it, it will harmonise with Scripture and make sense. Otherwise, it won't. And that brings me to my next point. To know whether a word or a passage is to be interpreted literally or symbolically, try interpreting it literally first. If it makes sense and doesn't do violence to the simple laws of nature, then you know it is to be interpreted literally. Otherwise, interpret it symbolically. So, so basically, just use some common sense as well. Yes, exactly. Right. Yahweh wants the Bible to be understood, of course. That's why he gave it to us. He's not deliberately hiding the meaning just to be arbitrary. In fact, this is another point to keep in mind. A lot of times, Yahweh repeats prophecies using different symbols and parables. Each repetition brings out different aspects, different details. To understand a prophecy or vision, it's necessary to look at every time that particular instance is talked about in Scripture. Okay, well, that's a good point, because I know another thing that is is helpful in, in learning the true meaning of a figure or symbol, and it's to track through Scripture. Wherever it is explained, just insert your interpretation. If it makes sense, great. If not, just keep on digging. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that out. The same holds true if we want to know if we have the correct historical event for the fulfilment of a prophecy. If every single word of the prophecy has been literally fulfilled, then you can know that your interpretation applying that particular historical event to the fulfilment of the prophecy is correct. Well, what happens if it seems to fit really, really well, but there are a couple of points off? Well, you need to look for a different interpretation, maybe right. even yet future. The thing that most people don't understand is that there is such a thing as a partial fulfilment of prophecies. We can learn a lot from these partial fulfilments. But remember Revelation 10, where John was told to eat the scroll? Scroll, yeah, absolutely. He said it was sweet to his mouth, but bitter to his belly. And what did the angel say to him immediately following his experience? Well, in fact, why don't you read it for us? It's uh, Revelation 10 and it's verse 11. I've got my bookmarker here. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now that's a principle. There can mm. be accurate, valid, partial fulfilments of prophecy. Yeah. But to know if you have the complete and final fulfilment of a given prophecy, every single particular must be literally fulfilled. Yahweh is very careful to make sure that history and prophecy agree. So even if a single detail lacks fulfilment, you have to look for some other event or wait its future development. It's all very common sense rules, aren't they? It really makes sense. And, and I want to just insert one more, and that is we we have to have faith. Mm. We, we have to believe that Yah's word never fails and put our complete and total confidence in him. Amen. And mm. if we come to him wanting to know the truth, angels will be sent to be our teachers. The Holy Spirit itself will guide our thinking. The Father will never allow any who trust in him to be led astray. And that's why it's safe to study any new idea with an open mind. Yah won't allow us to be deceived against our will just because we're investigating new ideas. Yeah, that's right. But we can trust him to keep our minds safe. Yeah. Well, it looks like we're out of time for today. If you've got any questions or comments, please send them to us. Go to our website at worldslastchance.com and click on Contact Us. We want to hear from you today, if possible. We may not be able to address everything on air, but we'll at least try to answer in the Q&As on our website. Hello, this is Elise O'Brien with your Daily Promise from Yah's Word. Most young people are filled with optimism. The future is bright and their eyes are starry with dreams and plans. But as we all know, life happens 
and it usually doesn't happen exactly the way we thought it would when we were young. As life experience accumulates, anxiety and uncertainty combined with depression can become a real issue for many people. In fact, one study found that 85% of people diagnosed with major depression were also diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. 35% had symptoms of panic disorder. But that's not all. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is also an anxiety order that is common among veterans and many who have lived through extremely traumatic events. OCD, or obsessive-compulsive disorder, is also an anxiety disorder. The truly surprising thing about OCD is how common it is. Medical Daily stated, quote, Though the intrusive, unwanted thoughts of obsessive-compulsive disorder have to be extremely intense for someone to be diagnosed with OCD, a new study shows that 94% of people experience such symptoms in their daily lives, unquote. In other words, OCD is shockingly common. And it's not surprising. As conditions in the world worsen, as times get harder and people struggle to earn enough money to meet their basic needs, as these struggles are made worse by extremes of inclement weather and political turmoil, there's a lot to be anxious about. The wonderful thing is that Yah is still in control. In 1841, the poet, Robert Browning, published a verse drama that contained a statement that has become famous for its simple yet profound faith. It says, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. The mountains of difficulty in front of you, the complicated situation in which you find yourself, none of that matters because Yah's in his heaven, so all's right with the world. Second Chronicles 16 promises, The eyes of Yahuwah run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. You may very well be in danger. You may be in circumstances too complicated for any human wisdom to know how to resolve. But that's okay. You've got Yah on your side. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 41 contains a message to you from Yahweh. Listen and let the words embrace your heart with assurance. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Yahweh is with you wherever you go. He is in his heaven, so no matter what else may happen, all is right with the world. We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. This has been a fascinating topic today, Dave. I heard of Zadok, the high priest, but I have to admit, I've never known he was uh, used as a symbol of a special group of people, those who are privileged to serve Yah himself. Yes, it was new to me too. And what a beautiful concept. In John 17, Yahushua prayed, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true Eloah, and Yahushua, the anointed, whom thou hast sent. It is the personal presence of Yah that brings us joy. It is what eternal life is all about, dwelling in the personal, actual presence of the Creator forevermore. 
And yet this privilege is available in a very real sense to the sons and daughters of Zadok even now. Mm, it is. It's beautiful. And I was thinking about this concept, this, this idea of ministering unto Yahuwah. You discussed earlier how we do that. But another way we minister to Yah is when we cooperate with him in saving others. And what greater opportunities to do that than now? at the very end of time. Yes, that's so true. Yahweh is nothing if not fair. In fact, Jeremiah records Yahweh as saying that he delights in loving kindness and justice. He delights in it. Okay, so in this epic struggle against sin and Satan, he's been very careful to keep everything fair. He didn't want our world being overrun with demons, so he banished them, even though by the terms of engagement, this meant that he and the holy angels had to withdraw as well. So you're saying it was for our protection? Yes, it was exactly, because while Yahuwah will never use force, the evil powers that be will and do. By withdrawing, Yahuwah has limited both the powers of evil and the powers of good to working through human instrumentalities. Of course, as we get closer to the end, the veil between the seen and the unseen is thinning. The day is going to come when Satan appears, impersonating Yahushua, surrounded by his legions of evil angels, all pretending to be holy angels. But, for now, both sides primarily employ humans to be their representatives. As such, we, you and I and everyone listening, we are Yahuwah's hands to do good. We are his voice to comfort and encourage, to instruct in truth and righteousness. And that is is the glorious privilege, the high calling of the sons and daughters of Zadok. And I can really see that because truth is advancing. But how's Yah going to let the world know? How's he going to tell your family, your neighbour, your boss? He's going to use the voice of those who are wholly committed to ministering to him. By ministering unselfishly to others, you are ministering to the Father. Well, one thing I've noticed in my own life is that once you embrace some new truth, it's it's beautiful. It's it's exciting, Dave. You want to share it with others. Truth carries with it added responsibility. Yeah, but it's it's more than just duty. It's it's a joy. You want to share with others the truths you found. Take, for example, the question in our daily mailbag today. Prophecy is Yah's gift to us. It lets us know what to expect and what's going to happen in the days ahead. It's why there are so many articles on prophecy on our website. When you've studied out a passage of the Bible, when you've carefully compared Scripture with Scripture, the Spirit of Yah has led you into more truth. You can't help but share the truth you've discovered. You want to pass on the gift that you've been given. You want to minister to Yahweh in the person of those around you. Mm, that's true. And that, that's how this end time message is going to go, by thousands of voices all over the world. At World's Last Chance, we're doing our best to take the message to the world, but we need your help. Yah needs your help. You have your own sphere of influence. You have connections. You know people. You can reach people that we can't. And let me tell you, they need to be warned. Just think how horrible it would be if someone were deceived because he hadn't been warned. Well, like we said a moment ago, Yahweh is fair. He reads the heart. He's not going to allow anyone who truly desires to be saved to be led astray. But... You're right, we do have a responsibility to warn people of what's going to be happening in the days ahead. We need to speak up. There are others who are longing to be closer to Yah, to know more of his truth. They, too, would minister to Yahweh if they had the chance to know the truth. And we have a responsibility to share it with them. Yeah, we really do. And we're almost out of time. And yeah, there's, there's a lot that has to happen. The trumpets have to sound, demons appearing as aliens, the Pope exalted to being over the whole world, the devil appearing as Yahushua. The seven last plagues being poured out. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The close of probation and the seven last plagues being poured out. But the thing we forget is how very quickly this can all take place. We're not talking about generations or years and years' time. Things are going to close up pretty quickly, and the final events will be rapid ones, and we need a heart preparation that we haven't had yet. We need to be committed to Yah, and doing His will on a whole new level. 
the identifying mark of the sons and daughters of Zadok is holiness and righteousness. And you're not going to find that in the fallen religious systems ruled over by the Eli ministry. It's not there. They're more satisfied with keeping the status quo. They don't want the Elijah's warning of impending crisis. They reject them and persecute them. Like Ahab asked Elijah, is that you, you troubler of Israel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the very one that was primarily to blame for Israel's troubles was shifting the blame onto the one to try and save Israel. <laughs> and the same holds true today. The ministers draw paychecks from organisations that have stated creeds. They don't want to jeopardise their income or their influence by going against the system. This is the fallen Eli system. You're not going to find truth there, folks. It's time to come out. Yeah, and there's not a lot of time left. You just look at the events happening in the world around you and it becomes clear how very little time is left. Now is the time to get ready. And listen, if you don't feel like it, if you want to cling to this pet sin or that favourite indulgence, you can always ask Yahweh to help. Ask him to make you willing, to be made willing, to make a full surrender he will. More than anything, he wants to draw you close to him, to dwell with you forever. Join us again tomorrow. And until then, remember, Yahweh loves you and he is safe to trust. told Timothy, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you will carefully read through the material on our website, you will have a thorough grounding in not only doctrinal truths, but you will also learn the secrets to effective prayer and how to study the Bible so you can discover truth for yourself. Visit our website at worldslastchance.com. It's never too late to get started. been listening to WLC Radio. This program, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available for downloading on our website. These are great for sharing with friends and Bible studies. It's also a wonderful resource for those worshipping Yahweh, alone or at home. If you would like to listen to Radio WLC programs, visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the home page. This will allow you to download the episodes in your preferred language. There are also articles and videos available in a variety of languages.
You have been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Mm-hmm.